and you are very welcome to Star Sports TV. It's Johnny Ward here, and over the next 15 minutes, we're going to have plenty of chat about the weekend's action. Uh, we're going to start off with racing with Luke Tarr. John Spitz Cup is coming up. We also have the Irish Oaks, as the brilliant racing just continues. And we will have some running and riding plans as well for you uh, for the Irish Oaks. We also will have to, of course, talk uh, the West Indies and England in the second test. Ryan Seinbottom will be on to discuss that. Uh, England still tips on for glory there. William Kajani is going to talk politics. Lots happening in the US. And of course, we can't forget what's going on in the UK as well. And we're going to talk golf as well. Uh, Blue Horseshoe will be on to talk about the weekend's action. And we will have Simon Ott later on in the show as well. Luke Tarr is in the house. How are we, Luke? Morning, Johnny. How are you? I'm not bad. I'm not bad. I know uh, we've said that it's like not the busiest weekend of race in terms of the crazy race we've had, but what's the ground going to be like at York for the John Smith's Cup? Because it's strange over here in Ireland. In the West, it's really wet. Uh, in the East, I think it's like good ground and down patch today. What are they going to get at York? I think it'll be decent ground, actually. There's no rain forecast. Speaking of good ground, I'm looking at that picture in the background, Johnny. A good pub quiz for you. The McManus colours. What string do you have to be to have the red hat with the white star? God. I'm going to say, like, 27th. Yeah. Something like that. No laytown this year. Devastating. Called off. Yeah, it's, it's, that, it's, it's an unbelievable visit. Like uh, That horse looks like it's, it's snuck in in the Kerry National of yeah. like 9-4 at 40 from a train I've never heard of. As a reserve, yeah, with a controversial horse pulled out on the day on ground uh, reasons, you know. Right, should we get into John Smith's handicap before I get in trouble and you get lynched? Right, 6-1 to one the field. Talk to me. Um, yeah, six to one. The field very open. That you got fifth position right at the top there. He was favourite for the Lincoln that never was to join the Grand National that never was, etc., etc. Um, that that form behind Sir Busk and Dark Vision rightly puts him at the top of the market. He looks every bit short enough for me. Um, solid stone, Michael. Stout. Look at the trainers at the top of the card. Varian, Stout, Gosden, Haggis. They're all there. Funnily enough, the one I fancy is Caradoc. There's mm -hmm. an eight to one chance trained by Ed Walker. Um, good piece of form at York last year, and uh, just pretty eye catching and, comeback at Epsom. Yeah, Epsom. That's sick. The Epsom. He was never near. I don't think he necessarily wanted to be. Um, I think the what are you trying to horses, say? With the exception of English King, they've all needed the running. He just looks like the one that can step forward a bit for me at the top of the market. I would stick with him. And if if we've got to find one at a price, we've always got to find one at a decent price and handicap like this. I do like Tin and Dali of David O'Meara's. Now, I know he's an Irishman, but he's also a Yorkshireman at heart, really. He's lived there a while now. I think there's no race he'd rather win than this up there. His horses are running well. He had that Sky Defender run well at Epsom in that same race. Summerhan got touched off at um, Royal Ascot. I, I think the Omara team are in, are in good order. And I'd, I'd, pick, I'd take him at 16s, but Caradoc was the one at the top of the market for me. <laughs> Pavon trying to go back and win the race back-to-back -back as well, which is quite interesting. Um, I thought Kieran Fallon booked a great example. I think he's absolutely fantastic value for what you can get off of, out of him. He's going to be an outstanding rider, possibly better than his dad, maybe more stable than his dad as well, which always helps. Uh, well, I don't think that'd be hard, Johnny. No. You know, it, it, I wouldn't mind a bit of even money gets in less trouble than his dad, but I think I wouldn't want even money rides more Group 1 winners than his dad. There we go. That's a, that's a fair call, yeah. So is, is this like a good race for punters, do you think? Or are you kind of um, sussing out how, you know, the I guess the draw and so forth and how it's going to actually pan out on the day? No, it's a, good, it's a staple diet of the summer, isn't it? John Smith's handicap. People look forward to it. I like these big handicaps. Put it this way, if you're a football punter, you don't really ever fancy something at 14s in a football match, do you? But mm. you get a big handicap, you can genuinely make a case for something at 14s. It's, it's a weird paradox, that. But I, I like the, the, the uh, handicaps, and I think this will be busy. It's a real illusion, isn't it? Because if you back a 7-1 to one shot who's favoured in a handicap at Cheltenham, it's like, oh yeah, I backed a favourite. If you back a 7-1 to one shot in a football match, people say you're mad. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, maybe well, right. let, let, let them, Johnny. Yeah, let them, let them. Who cares? Let's talk about the Irish Oaks. I've given you Dunnock O'Brien riding plans. I've given you Joseph O'Brien riding plans. I've given you Aidan O'Brien riding plans or something like that. Anyway, at least I've given you some tips. And this is going to be a really good Irish Oaks. But the mad thing, obviously, is, Luke, this is just happening pretty close after Epsom. It's not that far since Royal Ascot, really. Uh, we have horses who ran in Nace the other day, even so in the Burnham, who could run. This is a fascinating race and betting coming through as well. 
Yeah, uh, look, it's a great race. You've got um, Kai and Pepper that technically came second to Magical. I don't think anything came second. I think they were all technically eighth equal or something, weren't mm. they? That was ridiculous. But Fancy Blue won the French Oaks. Peter won the Irish Guineas. Um, Emma Steinin, <laughs> who I'll probably pronounce wrong, and you can correct me. There's no better form out there with love flying around. Uh, I think Fancy she's going wrong as well. Yeah, I, I, I was surprised. that We had this argument, me and you, last night that I didn't think she was going to run. She is going to run and, well, we think she is going to run and I think she'll now go very close. Um, this should be you giving me the winners. What price, Johnny, in the next next year or so, we'll have to, we'll have to go to the team this morning, that we have the, a one, two, three in, an, in a group one for Joseph Donnacher and Aidan. It can't be far away, can it? No, I, I don't know if... Um... Yeah, that could have happened if 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 Dunica ran uh, his Philly Fancy Blue in this. That could be more feasible. I'm not sure he has the classic hopes this season, but he has, as he said, his biggest asset has been Aidan O'Brien's son, and that's kind of true because it's like he's been handed all these horses. And um, I tell you, one who's interesting, right? Laburnum. I did my brains in this horse when I ran at Nace. It was only beaten a neck by even so on its second start. And if Aidan pitches this in, if you saw he won a listed race during the week there with a horse who had no entitlement to be there in Killarney. It was basically coming out of a maiden and won easily, basically. These Galileos can just improve. So Laburnum each way, I'm not sure she's as far behind. And if he pitches her into the race, I think he's really confident she can run well. Aidan, that is. Yeah, I, I think Peaceful would be the one I'd slightly edge towards. Being by Galileo, I'm sure she'll get the, she'll get the trip. Um, you can't go for wrong with them. But I, I, I think it's a fascinating race. And... I'll leave it to you as our resident Irish correspondent to find the winner of the Oaks and I'll try and find the winner of the John Smith's Handicap. For you us. got anything else for the weekend? Yeah, I am a stickler for loyalty and following a horse even out of stupidity. Um, but I'm convinced this Liberty Beach is the future of, of sprinting in this country. Um, it ran brilliantly at Ascot. Slightly disappointed when second at Sandown to Ali last time out, but comes back out in the city walls this weekend. Three to one favourite, I'd expect him to go in. In the Rose Bowl at Newbury, the exciting method runs. Boring seven or four favourite, but again, a really exciting type looking to go in. For the last leg of the Trixie away from the two top races at the weekend. In the Aphrodite at Newmarket, the Philly Stakes, Horse I was really taken with was La Luna. I don't know if you've noticed her, but Henry Candy, he knows how to get mm -hmm. it done. She's only rated 95. It's a big step up for her, but that form behind Antoine de la Vega would be for me. So at three to one, seven to four, four to one, a little win, Trixie, to go with a Caradoc in the John Smith's handicap. And you're going to put your colours to La Burnham in the Oaks, I believe. I am, and I should mention as well, if you're pipped at the post, our ITV promotion, if you're beaten up to a neck, you get 100 quid back, up to 100 quid. And the way my look is at the moment, I don't know if yours is similar. You'll get me half a length. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty much. So uh, that promotion is definitely worth uh, mentioning as well, because um, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing worse than a succession of sort of narrow seconds, and we've all been there, Luke. Yeah, I think the, um, the key to that offer uh, that we're running is that it's up to 100 quid. Mm. You look at a lot of the high street firms and the firms on those check it, you're going to get your fiver and tenner back. Uh, yeah. When you've and had a bet and you look in your account and there's a fiver back, it almost annoys you at times. So I think <laughs> up to 100 quid is a more than fair offer. So get involved with that, ladies and gents. Top man, Luke. Ryan Sidebottom is in the house. Good morning, Ryan. How are you? Morning. How are we doing? I'm not too bad. Why are England still tips on to win the series? Explain that to me. Well, yeah, look, I tipped them to win the series 2-1. The Through history, or the last 18 months, England, in terms of being slow starters, have, have shown why. Um, they generally don't play very well early on um, in test series. Um, but look, it showed West Indies looked a little bit more comfortable. Um, I thought they played brilliantly. They've got a, a quartet of both fast bowlers who can take 20 wickets. So England are under pressure now, but generally England come back very much stronger on the latter tests, you know, when they've been comfortable in the surroundings and they've played a little bit of cricket. But it, it's a new, I suppose it's a new area for both teams, you know, having not played any cricket for the last four or five months. So it's, it was a, a weird test match, but I thought West Indies played the test match better than England. Is your broad come in now? 
I think so. I mean, it was a huge surprise to everybody, wasn't it? His exclusion. Um, I thought he's he's brilliant, you know, bowler in English conditions. He's been the man in form. He played brilliant in South Africa. So it was a huge surprise. And I think it probably showed. You know, it's always better the devil you know when someone's not selected or he should he should be playing and he could have done a better job. But you never quite know, do you, until you're actually playing and you're in that situation. What do you think at Old Trafford? So it's two to five England, seven to two the West Indies. Yeah, like I think England are going to be comfortable winners. You know, Old Trafford is relatively fast and bouncy. It should be a good pitch. Um, it's generally full of runs and it spins on day four and day five. So, look, England for the win for me. Um, I think they'll be too strong. They always tend to come back strong, stronger in second, third test matches. They are notoriously slow starters. And I think there might be, you know, Joe Root comes back. Um, will Stuart Broad also be in the side? Will Ben Fox replace Butler as keeper? So there's a few areas for England to ponder over and who, you know, team selection is going to be. And what are Ben Stokes as a cigarette at some stage? Oh, I mean, Ben Stokes is amazing, isn't he? I mean, what a what a player, what a character, big big player. And he's he was my special for Star Sports. I've gone for him, you know, to score 50-plus runs, uh, take one wicket and a catch in the first innings. Because um, he generally, he does all right for everybody, doesn't he? So Ben Stokes, for me, is a, is a very special player and a Ben Stokes special I've gone for. Top man and uh, the best Barnard I think we're going to see all morning. Oh, goodness me, I think I need the hedge trimmers from my uh, garage to get rid of, sort it all out. It's an absolute mess. Enjoy the second test. Thanks, mate. Everyone else, enjoy. Take care. So retweet this video post, and if Stokes scores 50 on his first innings, you will be in with a chance to win a 50 quid free bet. And now it's time for Hit the Tweet Spot. This is your chance to win a pony best, free 25 quid bet. All you have to do is actually just mention uh, Star Sports on Twitter or reply to one of our tweets. And this week's winner is Gary Kelly. We're going to be in touch with you, Gary. So keep an eye out over the next few weeks because you could win a free pony bet with Hit the Tweet Spot. Now it's time for politics with William Kajani. How are you, William? Very well, thank you. Great to be with you. Yeah, you too. I want to bring up something very quickly here because Donald Trump, when he got elected uh, the last time, obviously, was a massive shock. Brexit was a massive shock. 8 to 13, Joe Biden. What can possibly go wrong? This is buying money, is it not? If you're buying money, I'd agree with you if it was tomorrow the election was held. The polls it's in four time. Yeah, but it's in four months' time. Um, the polls now, I think, are aligned with our markets. Um, which wasn't the case a couple of months ago, let me tell you. And, you know, if Texas is a battleground state, if Mississippi is a battleground state where the poll is, say, is competitive, then, yeah, it'll be a vital blowout. But there's still four months to go. Um, and we just don't really know what shape America will be in the four months. You couldn't predict where we'd be now four months ago. And I think it's worth... I think it's just worth being a bit cautious, seeing if that's a general polling trend rather than piling the budget. Eight to thirteen, uh, Biden. Six to four, Trump. Now, what can Trump actually do in the next four months to make this even remotely feasible? I've been reading on CNN various political commentators saying the betting is quite slanted towards Biden, but it actually should be a lot more slanted. He needs something of a miracle, does he not? Um, it's a really big comeback effort, and he needs. I think he needs to improve something by like at least seven to eight points in general mm -hmm. terms to make this a real fight. I don't think it's impossible he can get to where he was in 2016, which was within the margin of error. And then that would be a more interesting conversation at 8 to 13, 6 to 4. I mean, he can do it by basically doubling down on economic measures and doubling down on public health measures. But the White House is currently running into fear as against Anthony Fauci, so he doesn't seem inclined to go in that direction. I think Biden's a strong favourite. I think he's the right favourite. Wouldn't know if I'd agree with the blowout predictions that economists are making, the models are making, but just have to wait and see. Closer to home, eight to eleven uh, and six to five, a very tight race, obviously for the next general election. Uh, the Conservatives are favourites there. Yes, they are, um, which I think is fair. Um, Sakir Starmer has made a good start um, in terms of his time in the helm of labour. When I say good, I don't mean in terms of policy, I mean in terms of PR perception. Mm -hmm. But there are quite a few stumbling blocks I think he has to overcome. My feeling with the current Conservative polling is that they can still go down a bit, probably. 
And that's probably for two reasons. I think there are two things that are really anchoring um, the Conservative vote, or at least the approval rate of Boris Johnson. One of them, I think, is the furlough scheme, which will have to be, they say, wound down. And I think it'd be a big problem if that isn't um, put into specific industries. And the other, I think, is a Brexit attachment. Um, now, when things get difficult um, for the likes of Rishi Sunak in terms of how do you continue a recovery or do you get um, another spike in cases or whatever, that can still drive approval ratings down. I mean, we're very far out from next general election. We're seeing more requests and market activity in terms of the next permanent prime minister, where Sakir Starr was 6 to 4, but Rishi Sunak is getting a lot of interest at 4 to 1. And when will Boris Johnson leaves, I mean, we've got it, I think it's two on. He goes to 2024. Um, plenty of people disagree with that. They don't think he'll make it. So Absolutely not. Absolutely no. not. So that will be a really interesting market. I think we'll see a lot of in the coming months. We've got to conclude with, I'll kid you not. I kid you not this week is about everybody's favourite cultural artist, Kanye West, who's now running for president. Um, now, we haven't seen... I'm seen intrigued as to where you're going with this. <laughs> right, so he's a 66 to 1 shot with us to make it to the White House first time. Um, no chance of that. I think really interesting is he's 40 to 1 for 2024, um, where he would be properly on the balance if he can be bothered to do that work correctly. One thing to note before I go, third party candidates, even running as a joke, can influence elections quite a lot. You only need a few thousand votes in a tight swing state, and suddenly the electoral mass looks very, very different. Thank you, William. Thank you very much. G'day, golf fans. Welcome to week two at the Memorial. This week, it's the Memorial. That's right, it's Jack Nicholas's tournament. And if the finish from the workday open is anything go by from last week, then we are in for a doozy of a tournament. This is a very, very challenging golf course, as you can see. And now they've made their rough longer this week and mined the greens and made them even faster. Well, that's going to make things even tougher. Blue Horseshoe did quite well last week. We placed two uh, of our selections, Jason Day and Patrick Cantlay. And Sam Burns, if he'd even just kept his round together in the fourth round, would have placed for us at 175 to 1. So um, never mind, we'll up onwards and upwards. This week, Blue Horseshoe loves Xander Chauflay as one of his main picks. And to see who else we like and why, just look on the starsports.bet blog and good luck. Over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to introduce you to some of the Star Sports team, including Hannah Baycroft, and watch out for the audio in the background here. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. Hi, everybody. My name is Hannah Baycroft, and I am super excited to be joining the Star Sports TV team. Now, throughout lockdown, I have had the privilege of interviewing some of racing's biggest names, and I cannot wait to share them all with you. Make sure you're following our page, and I'll see you all next week. Now it's time for betting people, and let's uh, go over to Simon Ott, who's going to introduce uh, Shane Trelleo, who has some fascinating things to say about punting down under. Hi, Johnny. Uh, this week's betting people is with Shane Trelleo. Now, Shane is a professional punter based in Australia, but a lot of what he talks about translates to anyone that bets for a living. Talks about backing up uh, what you see with facts and figures. He talks about learning how to win and he also talks about coping with losing runs, even going to the extent of going on a mindfulness course. Um, it's top stuff to watch. We've been putting it up really early and the Australians have been lapping it up before we've even got out of bed. So we're very pleased with this one. Here's the trailer. If I lose my head, I'm going to lose all my money. It's as simple as that. You know, If, I, if I'm betting emotionally, um, I'm going to lose. I don't know. Let's just say I'm... This, this for an example, so I'm down 20,000 this week, yeah, you know, and it starts playing on your mind and you like this favourite, it's $2 and it's, you've rated it $2, but if I have 10,000 on this, I'm only losing 10 for the week, I can deal with that. All those sorts of things come into your, come into your head. Thanks a million for watching this week. Uh, we're on starsportsbet.co.uk. Don't forget to download the app. And of course, our number is 08000 Very easy to remember that one. And thanks to all the guys for their input this week. We'll see you next week.